Yeah, yeah, I know. I have it. Yeah, I'll call you back later. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Bob. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mike said if we uh, Mike said if we screw it up, you know, at any point. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, it's the John, you know about John, and he'll obviously introduce himself, but John is a Marine. Um, well, I, I say was a Marine, but I think once a Marine, always a Marine. Always a Marine, yes. Right, and right. he, you know, what he does now, I think is so, admire, I so admire that because he helps other veterans like himself. And he'll share his story right now, let me tell you, but he helps so many countless people like himself. And other people that that need that you know transition help, he helps them. He helps them all day long, and he really sacrifices his own time and his own efforts, and gets a lot of stuff together. I thought it would be a good idea because I want to talk to you guys, but I felt I felt like it's a great um, connection to 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 have this topic that we're going to talk about, you know. And and I think John is a perfect gentleman. John, please please uh, share a little, just a little bit about yourself, whatever you can. Well, before I get into my soul, I, I got to tell you guys, this is a real thrill for me. I, I've been watching you guys since inception, you know, and just, uh, you know, the, the military, the combatives, you know, this is the ultimate closest to the gladiator death match that, you know, anybody could ever witness was you guys kicking this whole thing off. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm just thrilled, man. This is a, a real, a real, ex a great experience for me. And uh, I'm a big fan. So. Well, yeah, we appreciate thanks. that very much, John. Yeah, a lot of people we have to, as Don and I do different podcasts, we have to kind of remember, remind them that the UFC today with known as mixed martial arts with roughly 47 or 49 rules today was not the same uh, element it was back in the beginning when they only had uh, two basic rules, no biting, no eye gouging, even then those were not grounds for disqualification. <laughs> You more or less got your hand slapped and be like, uh, you know, don't do that. And by the way, give him his eyeball back. And I say that kind of hiddenly <laughs> like that. And yet uh, one of the athletes, his name, is, his name was Paul Marlins, uh, the Alaska polar bear. And he ended up getting his eye raked a couple of times, continued to have problems with his eye and eventually lost eyesight in his eye. So I'm thinking, you know, even that rule was violated at some point in time. So yeah. it was like, and then when you look at no time limits. Uh, they wanted ultimate victory. Is what they were looking for. So yeah. it was. It was. It was a, just a different time. I don't, era. Know. I don't know how you guys this, did it. This this know. crazy cowboy back here. He's, he's been in more highlight uh, matches. That uh, as I go, I'll watch him as I go. Oh, out <laughs> each. You know. Nah. You, you both. You <laughs> both did. But you mentioned about biting. I think biting was done a few times, and and like you said, nothing. What's going to happen? Nothing, right? What are they going to do? There was no regulation. There was no rules, really. I think this is way before rules were written. This is like you guys wrote the rules, so to speak. Don't do that, you know. But crazy, man, crazy, crazy. I got a, I got a good buddy of mine who was just like part of your tribe. He was doing the tough man. He was managing and fighting in in the Fresno Valley, and you know, so it was back in the back in the rough and tumble days where this. This was underground, you know. So, um, so, so uh, I'll just tell you that uh, I've been working with um, at-risk transitioning combat vets for about twenty-five years, and uh, including my son, who did two deployments in Afghanistan with the Tenth Mountain Division. And I, I, I got a pretty good understanding of uh, out-of-control vets because I was raised by a Marine Corps uh, Korean War combat veteran who then changed to the air force, uh, and became a reconnaissance photographer. And after he died, uh, he wouldn't let anybody tell me these stories, but he got shot down with his pilot and they had to live in the, in the, the jungle and the swamps to avoid getting captured. And so he came back from, from, I was told he was deployed in Thailand, but they were flying missions over Vietnam. And so, uh, he's just a violent, you know, alcoholic. And had no idea how to how to control his anger, and you know what he what he did to our family was far more than abuse, and it was criminal, you know. And so I grew up with a really really uh, incredibly violent father, and uh, I went in the army briefly, and then I went, uh, and then I went in the Marine Corps. I went I went in the Marine Corps to please him, 
um, which is kind of a weird thing when you really kind of hate most of somebody. But, uh, you know, and I, long story short, my son, uh, when he grew up, he, he went in the army and um, he, uh, he was going to re he was wondering if he should re-enlist on August, in August, uh, uh, July, late July of 2001. And he, and he called to ask what I thought. And ultimately he decided to stay in, get a bonus, get a stripe. And like a month later, it's 9-11 and he's in Uzbekistan by October 15th. You know, he does two deployments over there. And, uh, you know, so I've been living this as a parent, you know, like it's really, um, it's a, it's a, it's a strange experience to have your kids overseas and in in such a dangerous area. And so he went through his own, you know, catastrophic transition challenges when he got back and it freaked me out because they're running my, my dad and what was coming home to our family. And, um, so I, a long story short guys is I, uh, I took this 25 years that I have had experience and I, I, I kind of retired back from working with direct with veterans directly one-on-one, but I, I took them seriously and I started adopting young vets and, uh, really, really helping them get through the transition process. So I decided to write a couple of books about it and, and record some audio books. And the, the first one was, it's an hour, it's an hour and 20 minute video, excuse me, an audio book called uh, transitioning veterans how we get in our own way and what to do about it and it and it's really about how to deal with triggers and what happens when we get activated what happens when we get over you know we we get triggered and all of a sudden bad things happen so how can we get a hold of that and get ahead of it and self regulate and this the second book it, it just came out in late march it's called be the dawn in the darkness uh, the relentless pursuit of becoming who we are meant to be. And it is about generational trauma with veterans, military families. It is about not passing that on to our kids. Um, it's about the power of mentors, uh, matriarchs and patriarchs that make a huge difference in our lives when we're young. Um, and when it's an about, it's about transition, all these, a lot of the lessons that I learned over the years came down to veterans don't ask for help. They teach you how to suck it up. They don't teach you how to find help or ask for it. And you don't want anything in your medical records. You don't want to be held back from a, a security job because of your security clearances because you ask for help. They're called barriers to care. So I thought I would just write about real experiences that my son and I went through. And it's not a self-help book. It doesn't tell anybody how to live their life, but it does talk about the different challenges that countless veterans i was able to draw from all these experiences to talk directly to like what the really is going what's really going on here and uh and it's it's really been received pretty well and it it, i think you guys can relate to it because once you take off your championship belt much it's much like a professional athlete taking off their uniform for the last time much like veterans taken off for the for the for the last time they don't tell you that you're going to go through an identity crisis when they separate you from the military. You guys probably didn't get some seminar helping you figure out what readjustment looks like. Not a bit. You got to run right into get, run, right, right. run right into this brick wall, and um, and that's what I did. I had a real hard time with my transition, and my son had a terrible time, and he he ended up getting killed on his Harley after he got back from two tours. You know because he. He needed the adrenaline to get out of his system so he can come home and relax and go to sleep. And so, uh, so that's a big, that's the big why behind what I do, what I do. You know, I, I don't, um, I don't want to do a lot of consulting and, you know, seminars and talking about all this stuff. I wanted to write it in a book to where veterans in the privacy of their own mind could read and listen to the audio book and really, really dig into identity, mission, meaning and purpose like you guys had an identity big time right as big as it gets and you had a mission which was to seek and destroy i would imagine or something similar to that yeah yeah you know and you had meaning and purpose i mean you were like so this is what happens for for veterans is we get galvanized into an identity you can see who we are by the stuff on our uniform we have every day we have a mission and there's nothing more powerful than 
taking care of people to your left and right and seeing to their welfare and serving, you know, something bigger than yourself. And all of a sudden you're nothing like Rambo. He was saying I was driving, you know, in charge of a tank and now I can't even flip cheeseburgers. Right. So there's a lot about that in this work, which is, it's not, it's not a self-help book. It is really about like what really sucks and what, what kind of difficulty do you go through and how do you pick yourself back up and move on and how the, the relentless pursuit. So uh, I, I, I could go on and on, but that's really what it's about. It's, it's really about people that suffer from trauma, people that suffer from depression, anxiety, you know, uh, drug abuse, substance abuse, you know, how do you transcend all that shit? And how do you make meaning of it? And how do you find something in your life that hopefully brings you joy? You know, and I found for me, it was about being the wounded healer for a good 10 years where I was doing my best to help others because I needed to move my pain or to eat me alive. And that was my avenue to figuring this, all this shit out for myself is that I needed to be of service to others so I wouldn't go deep and dark into my cave. Now you, you, I mean, I, I mean, already the fact that uh, you're, you're talking about three generations: your father, yourself, and your son. You have three generations that served in the military already. I mean, that's uh, I mean, first off, I mean, that that that's very admirable. A uh, trait. I mean, uh, any any father would like to have their their son kind of follow in their footsteps to a certain de- to a certain degree. I would think. Um, I mean, I have five children myself. I've got three sons and I've got two daughters. Um, I I can again. My life did not depend upon it when I climbed at that cage. I because I, I do work with uh, law enforcement, corrections, air marshal, border patrol, and military. I have a I have a certified ground combatives program that I work with. And to me, I always tell people that I had a safety net. I could do this thing called a tap out, or I tell the referee just pull this animal off me, and uh, you know I'm I'm out of harm's way. So that was, uh, you know, the safety net. I always tell them, you know, because I do and work with all these different people, first responders, they don't have a tap out. Their tap out means lights out forever. So I do I do take that a lot more seriously. Um, for being related just a little bit to what, what you're talking about there, I, I did two basic training camps where I left my family behind. Mm-hmm. I left it back in Coldwater, Michigan, and I stayed by myself. I trained by myself. I ate by myself. I became desensitized. I was not husband to. I was not father of. This was still during that no holds barred era. I prepared myself to be a heartless, no holds barred competitor so that literally you could take another man's life without ever bite late. There, there, there are only two rules of no biting. No, I got just all kinds of different ways you could take someone's life if you have the creativity and the desire to do so. I prepared myself to do exactly that if need be and have no remorse about it because as I walk in this cage, it's either you or me and I choose me in the process. So mm-hmm. again, I understand that, and, and, uh, that mentality and uh, and that's even where Big John would see like you know like the the that crazy look in some of our eyes when we we witnessed that name competition. There were some there were some really evil competitors at, at the time. You know, a people, person like a, a Tank Abbott that I mean he would have loved to have uh, killed somebody in that cage, knowing that he got away with murder legitimately. And I'm thinking, eh, you know, that's you know, no, it's not I, surprising. I come, from, I come from a world of competition, but but to me, it's like going. I wanted to keep it admirable, honorable, but. The two times that I did train full full bore, I was very desensitized to where even when I finally came back to my family, I had to kind of slowly ease back into it because it's like I wasn't didn't wasn't I wasn't being hugged on before. It's like that. It's like I was at a distance. A, a, a hug might have been a clinch. I gotta gotta go gotta go for the throw. <laughs> gotta go for the headbutt. Uh, you know, I don't, I'm not sure. You bring Depends. you bring up something uh, I, that you just spawned a thought. Um, I, my, when my son came home, it's actually in one of the chapters it's called the different faces of shame, you know, and, uh, very similar. How do you tell your family or your spouse that you'd rather be in combat? It's, you, you can't unhear yeah. those words. 
right? It's like there is a there is a sense of morality that is doesn't exist. And in in your world, as best I can compare it to my son's world, it was about supremacy on the battlefield. And when he when he got lit up enough, you know, the truth serum after uh, after drinking and smoking some weed, he would he would kind of let this stuff go and just like, man, you know, I, I, I fuck playing God. I was God, you know, and, you know, he he just missed the supremacy of the whole thing. And that's it kind of drove him crazy because when one moment you're you're completely off safe and you're you're out of control and you're you're expected to to be there and then all of a sudden you're at home and you're supposed to sit around and watch the grass grow you yeah, know and John, just, John, John didn't ask me <laughs> I actually wanted to ask all three of you but I'll start with you John and you made this you know made a comparison to Rambo right when they talk about Rambo in the movie saying that we created this killing machine and now this killing machine is home i think you guys all three of you in different different ways obviously were expected to be this exactly what Dan described, this merciless, desensitized, you know, human being, because there's no other way to go into battle, right? How can you go into battle if if you're not really galvanized, if you're not really that motivated and really explosive? How do you, coming back from that must have been incredible. But I mean, I know you don't, John, I don't know you don't like to talk about your son, but I know you started a lot of your work now and continued on is, is because of your son and because of what how his transition really was going on. It's just amazing to me, but how was that experience? That's just, just really mind boggling to me. Well, I mean, he, he, he came back and, um, you know, he was different. He was just, I, I can say he was a very scary guy. And he was also this charismatic guy with a big smile. And, you know, there's just that little hair trigger, you know, he could just turn into something different. And I noticed that right out, right off the bat, <clears throat> but, uh, you know, fortunately we had a really good relationship and I've been in the personal development field for 20, 20 years, you know, working with just really immersed in my own recovery, my own, my, my, we shared something in common, which was, per, we didn't want to go to counseling. We didn't want to sit down in front of somebody and talk about really messes up, but we were into personal development. Like we would, you know, listen to audio books and we, you know, we really had a, a, a fast track learning process where, you know, he, he wanted to go get a degree and be a mental health counselor because he thought he could do a better job than a lot of people he sat in front of. So he was going to Syracuse University and, um, you know, the day he got killed, he just got offered the job at Syracuse as their veterans liaison because he was the guy that confounded the counselors the most because he was just fresh back and he's, you know, he's uh, a father, he's a student, he's trying to figure all this stuff out. So when I talk about identity, mission, meaning, and purpose, this is for real. It's like, I knew who I was and now I don't know who I am. So we figured out, okay, so what's your new identity? And after a long conversation, I guess it's to be a student because I can't get a good job because I don't have a degree. Okay, so you're going to go get your GI benefits your military benefits, educational benefits. So what's your mission after a long conversation? Okay. Your mission is to go to the university, go to the VA, get all the logistics figured out about what it takes to get qualified. So that's your mission right now. So what's going to give you meaning and purpose? Well, I want to help other vets. Like I want to, I want to do that. So great. Now you have a vision of who you're going to become. And so he started at a little university, a little community college, got his AA and then we got him, you know, accepted into Syracuse uh, for their social work program. And so I really think that I I, I do know some fighters uh, I, I, by coincidence, um, and I noticed that this 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 identity crisis when somebody puts everything they about who they are into this 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 objective when they find out that who they really are and they can compete, and same thing in the military. It's just. Uh, it's a it's a heartbreak when it's over right. and some people deal with it better than others you know and mm -hmm. uh yeah. i mean i can go on and on but i i found a, a lot of meaning and purpose as a parent um to, to to do the best i could to sit back and listen and help him find his own answers 
like you guys had to find your own. And I, I've been doing some research, not just following you guys, but man, I tell you, you know, life after this uh, huge, huge success that you've had. And uh, I, I'm more curious about, you know, you know, Dan, I, I think you just shared a lot about how yours has gone. Well, how's it, how's it gone for you, Dan? I mean, Don? Well, just going from, from being a competitor and being, being at a private event, being in front of, you know, 50,000 people yeah. and then uh, hammer things that out and then say, the, okay, now you're out uh, cleaning the, the horse's horse pen. Doll, yeah. The horse doll or something like that. <laughs> like, you, go, you go from being the you know, a big, big star in Japan. And then all of a sudden you're you back just, I, I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, I, I mean, if you're, if you're, if you're willing to talk about it, I'm, cause it looked to me like you had a, you had a vocation, like you, you knew how to take care of yourself. You knew how to create a living, but all of a sudden yes, you're not in the ring anymore. Yes, I'm just sir. curious what that was like for you. It was hard. It was real hard. Cause, um, um, and you know, I hate to cry in my sleeve or anything, you know, but, you know, I was, I was molested three times when I was a kid, you know, when I was six the first time, then eight, and then I think 10 or 11, you know, and it was repeated. And, um, you know, first by a family friend and then a piece of shit that my parents uh, adopted and then by a piece of shit who I worked for at a, you know, as a dishwasher at a hotel. And, um, and so I found sports, you know, to, to blow it off and get rid of it. And plus also drink heavily too. <laughs> and uh, then when it was over, I broke my back and, you know, everything, everything, I fought through it, you know, as long as I could, you know, on medication and stuff. And that's when my career took a shit. And, you know, for the drinking and the, and the pills. And uh, then... When it stopped, I I tried doing the uh, acting gig, you know, and it didn't, didn't pan out for me. And and uh, I had multiple injuries on my back, broke my back, kept breaking it, and I break the rods, you know, I broke the rods three or four times, mm -hmm. uh, you know, because they fused ten or ten or eleven levels, you know, and so there's there's a lot a lot of surface to break, and I think the way to do it. <laughs> That's and, amazing. Uh, That's amazing. Shit. Uh, so then, you know, my wife decided. Uh, I, I, she said, I don't think you provide for the family anymore. So she uh, started having an affair with several people she worked with, and uh, kicked me out. And had me arrested a few times, and um, you know, shit went really bad. And then, then I. Uh, you know, then I pulled my head on my ass. A uh, friend of mine, I got a give me a school dog, you know, a puppy. She's old. You know, and, and it's four before that. And she just saved my life, you know. She, she helped me pull my head on my ass, got me back, got me back, appreciating everything. And, uh, you know, because I was ready to die. I didn't give a fuck, you know. I mean, I wasn't trying to. You know, I met some guy today, and he said he got in trouble for he tried committing suicide by cop, and I was accused of that, but that wasn't true. I just didn't give a fuck, you know. You know, I, the, the ex-wife called, you know, the, the sheriff's on me, and they showed up with ten cars, you know, and they were all kind enough to show me their AK-47s and, uh, or I mean, uh, their AR-15s and and their their uh, six-hour you know, nine millimeters, and I told them to shove them up their ass, you know, <laughs> and I wasn't impressed, but thank God they didn't, you know, they, they, they could tell I was, I was a dumb fuck, and, uh, so, ended up having, uh, like I said, broke the rods and had a surgery, then woke up, you know, four days later, had a hemorrhagic stroke, and they threw me in a coma for three weeks, and then, you know, I come out of that coma and I had to go to rehab for a few months and rebuild my life. You know, you know, you know learn how to walk, how to feed yourself, how to shower, you know, how to wipe your ass. You know, it's, it's, it's like being a big, giant baby. 
and uh, you know, like trying to fuck it up, you know, <laughs> trying to learn how to shower, you know, and you miss bugs, and uh, you know, it, it was fucking life. It was fucking life, and you know, but like I said, I got that bulldog, and she got me back in life. And, yeah. You know, shit. There's, I'm told God, I tell God every day, but she goes, I want to go. You know, there's nothing here on this planet for me except for her. You know, I got two daughters, but you know, the fact that they're grown up and they got their own life, you know, they won't miss me. And that dog will, and I'll miss her. So, yeah. fuck it. You know, she goes, I want to go. Hey, hey, it's like I could be talking to a, a uh, any one of the veterans I worked with over the years, man. Same I mean, thing. I, I, I'm, I'm thankful that they're all still here. They, you know, they, yeah, you, know, you made it through, you know, cause having meaning and purpose in your life to live, you know, and I, I just love what you guys are doing. You have such a huge fan base, a huge following, you know, and being able to just find your way through that. It takes a strong will. And, and now you're, now you're doing something you know, to really get yourself out there in the world. I think mean, it's awesome, man. Tribute. Hey, tribute to hey, you. Hey, Don, Don, you said something to me last time we spoke. And you said something that really, really got to me. You said that people expected, always expected you to be Don Fry. No matter how you feel for real, what, what's going on. And it kind of really made it a big impact on me. Because I figured no matter what happens to you, it's almost like a superhero. If you, you, You're forever Don Fry. You're forever Dan Severn. I don't give a shit what happens. Tomorrow you could go, go through some any kind of traumatic experience, whatever. Nobody cares. When they see you, they want that autograph. They want to be talking to to Don Fry, that's on top of the world in Japan, you know, beating down twenty people. That's Don Fry. They know, but they don't know the real struggle that sometimes people go through, which which is the same thing. The veterans, I think, in my opinion, they go, they create it's absolutely necessary for them to survive, to create, and they have this identity, and then to switch from that identity, like John just said, to have a different mission, to have a different purpose. So tough, man. I, I give you guys so much credit, and and it's it's the, the shit you had to go through, Don, especially you. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling to me, and I hear this now. It's like, um, I, I think people sometimes should spend more time learning and doing research, seeing what, what you guys go through before and after not just during that you know peak moment but what happens to you guys you know before and after that well, i talked to a lot of fighters you know and rex fighters and a lot of them had been molested you know so they carry that rage into the you know into the training and into the ring or cage you know and it helps them it fucking helps them you know i i wouldn't you know i wouldn't change my life fuck um Otherwise, I wouldn't be the person I was. All right, you know. Uh, I talk too much. This is the most I've ever fucking talked. I don't talk this much in a month. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but, well, but you, I'll, I'll jump into for a second. Even, even like uh, uh, Mike Tyson will talk about some of the, the horrors of, of his upbringing and that, and how it, uh, you know, his psychology when he was walking that ring. I mean, he really wanted to hurt somebody, you know, and, and that's the way that he conjured up. So there's a lot of people that are in some of these usually sports or or, the, or I should say just this combat sports where, you know, they have to, I mean, they you gotta separate yourself, you know, right. sorry about that. No, no, uh, I, I, nothing can compare to the act of war, you know, or going to war, but there are similarities, you know, between the fight game and war. And just like being in prison, when I when I come back from a fight, I tell everybody it takes two weeks to recover, and that's just mentally, you know. I mean, that's that's if you don't get hurt, that's just mentally, because you separate yourself from the whole fucking world, you know, why for that time to train before that fight, you know, because you have to, you, you become subhuman or non-human. You know, yeah, well, non -human. that's part of what I say. That exactly. By 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 not being around that family, I, I you you don't want a child to come up there to uh, hug and stuff like this because you're almost like you're not you're not ready for the, that that sensitivity that that niceness because you're you're preparing yourself for battle you're preparing yourself for war and knowing that okay there's only two basic rules no biting no eye gouging it's like we're gonna go to war man I've 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 seen you guys in 
and how you you just pro your the looks on your faces and how you're being man it's just it's just uh it's pretty scary man but you got you you've got to do that you've got to condition yourself and absolutely you know don you mentioned uh childhood experiences it's a big one for me because i've done a lot of men's work like men's groups I don't work, I, I don't work with women because I, I don't really, I mean, I, I can do my best to understand them, but I really understand the, the, what goes on with men, you know, right. and when we're you're not a man, around, you're a Marine, so you're a double man, you know? Well, it, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's great because when we're just with a group of men, nobody has to be impeccable and posture up because yeah. of the female <laughs> in the environment, right? And right. this alpha of the alpha bullshit kind of melts away right. and people can talk about really bad shit, you know, and, uh, and just being in groups of men, veterans and non-veterans, but I, I worked with a lot with veterans being creating a space for them to really feel, feel safe enough to where they'll, they'll open up and talk. Then they'll develop a level of trust with a bunch of, with a group of men. And then we're here in a tight, tight, compressed place together you know and you know really really the craziest stuff you're you don't want to hear needs to come out yeah. you know like guys talking about you know, i killed a family i don't know what to do i can't get rid of it in my head he didn't actually kill them intentionally but yeah. the terrorists would fire at them from a house and run out tie them up and then run out the back door and they would assault and just blow everything away only to find a family and intentionally they this they were left there as bait you know and so i'm you can probably edit this out you know mike but i'm just saying this is the kind of stuff that you how can you even talk about this like when you know like when you come back from a fight you know um but it's amazing what i was getting back to is when we do a lot of work with veterans i'm just amazed that the high percentage of men who talk more about their very difficult upbringings and the trauma that they never resolved that created this rage. I mean, it's, I, there's a, there's a chapter in the, in my book called retribution is far beyond rage. Yeah. Man, I tell you, that's the, that's the biggest thing we need to unwind with veterans is it goes far. There's no fear. Like I want to hurt someone, you know? Uh, and I can, I think you guys can relate to it obviously, but this sense of, of retribution but there's um there's actually a survey online called the Adverse Childhood Experiences Survey, the ACE survey, and ten questions about your childhood experiences. And just based on what you told me, Don, you know you probably got you score pretty pretty high on this survey. You know if you're at a four, your chances for drug addiction, um, domestic violence, alcoholism hypertension, least, you know, diabetes later in your, later in your life, suicide, it, the risk factors are pretty, pretty, pretty high. If you're a six or higher, they, they, they go even higher exponentially, but statistically a person will lose 20 years out their life. And if you're higher than that, you really got to do some inner work. And I, I mean, on a scale of 10, I'm, I, I'm, I scored a 10, 10 out of 10, yeah, you know? Wow. And so we oh, look yeah. It's amazing how many how many veterans that that and athletes they were driven to be world champions because of their trauma, like they turned that rage into retribution, and they 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 it, it gave them a special superpower, you know. And so I, I appreciate you being vulnerable and sharing that, Don, because I think that's one of the reasons why you're here and that's why you're with us is you made it through a lot and veterans relate to what you just shared. Like more than anything, they're in dark places. We have a cave. It's wet. It's cold. It's dark. And we we're fine. We, we created it. I can survive there. That's kind of where I'm coming from. Is, right, right. You know, when you're talking from an experience, like what you just shared, I hope you share it more. And I hope you talk to veterans more. I like yeah, fuck. I like to talk to veterans more, man. I mean, my dad, my dad was a lieutenant colonel in the Air Force. You know, he, he's a air commando in Nam in Thailand. 
you know, and then then became uh, military intelligence or communications, you know, and his brother, older bro- older brother, was a marine in Korea, and then a Green Beret in Vietnam. You know, their dad was a soldier in WW two in Germany, and when the crowd surrendered, they shipped his ass to Asia. So, <laughs> <laughs> wow, oh, I man. bet you it's interesting to think that your dad and my dad were probably he was in the Air Force, probably at the same base, flying missions or somehow involved in the Vietnam War. Yeah. About the same time. That's interesting. How old are you? I, I was born in England Air Force Base. You know. Okay. I was born at Shaw Air Force Base in South Carolina. How, how old are you? Hell, I don't know. 57, <laughs> 56, 58. I don't know. Okay. All right. Well, I'm, I'm 61. He just, so. he just had to figure out the changes every year. I don't know. That's what he had to figure out. That's a fluid so, number. That's a fluid number. No, nah, listen. Totally understandable, too. Well, you know, going back to one, one of the things that you talked about there, John Henry, and, and I'll share this there with you, that uh, um, at my training facility uh, in the Coar Mission, I, I dealt with a, a lot of uh, single men uh, that were trying to get into mixed martial arts. They wanted to get into cage fighting. And then when I would ask them why, you know, some of the guys were like, you know, their, 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 their response was because I want to fight and not go to jail. They wanted, so they're, they're looking at not really looking at it from the competition aspect. They just wanted to, they wanted to simply be involved in violence. I started uh, a deal like on Sunday nights. I don't know. It happened just out of, just out of a fluke. One day I had a couple of guys that were, they were behind the dues. I might go, okay, come on over uh, this coming Sunday and let's put in a little bit of sweat equity. So we're out there, you know, raking up leaves, branches, stuff like this. Well, we got a bird pile going out there. So we take a few stumps and we're just kind of sitting there just watching the fire and just, BSing about anything and everything. And for whatever reason, I, I can't, I, I'm making it okay. Fire is very primitive. I've got all these men that are here working. We got the fire, we're sitting down, and, and literally they started kind of opening up more and more. And I I, I, I make that, I, I would make that a regular thing whenever I'd be around on a Sunday night, every Sunday night, basically seven o'clock, that there'll be a fire out at the at Dan Service place. Come on in and, and just, you know, sit around. Don't talk about nothing or talk about anything you want to. So it was just it was just a way. It was only just just for men only. And you can be free. Wow. You can be yourself. There's, there's yeah. no pretending. There's no bullshit. No, no, nobody's there Straight to up. judge of it. It's just you're, you're, you're just up. you're glad to see each other and stuff like that. That that, that they're still because <laughs> each you know again it all depends on you might know, know a little bit more about somebody else. So they might know some issues that they're going through. But and you're just glad that they that they showed up and. If they're just sitting there and they, they at least listen to some of the other people talk. So yeah, it's hey, um Dan, I wanted right. to ask something for well, both of you guys, um, Dan and Don, but it's something you brought up before, something you mentioned before about this mentality about the um um uh, like you said about guys like Tank Abbott, for example, as an example, that he truly enjoyed hurting someone. In other words, I never put you the two of you guys in that category. There's other people like George St. Pierre actually says, I hated fighting. I don't think I think you both enjoyed fighting, but from the competitive stuff. But there's there's these several people I've seen, like you said, Tank Abbott, over your career. Um, was it difficult to contain emotions and contain control yourself and remain a competitor? Like when you fight, because I remember seeing that you spoke with Tank Abbott afterwards, very, very cordially, very, very professionally, I would say, right? Not there's no problem. But at the time, I think the emotions were really high when you meet this almost like a villain in the movie, right? Is that for you? Or me? Well, for, well, you know, you know, you guys. I mean, then you. Well, you, well I, 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 I actually was involved with a, uh, actually a long interview with Tate Cabot. I right. actually happened to be mm-hmm. at his home, and, and even with when the with the, when the gentleman was first trying to set this up, he was like, you know, he was like, he was. He was screening the process, like, will there will there be any problems? I go, I said, there there's not going to be any problems for me, again, because I again I, I I always look at it that I, I'll I'll conduct myself as a professional and in, in, in all aspects. Um, in my I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into two different aspects of this. In my competitive career, I never treated anybody worse than Tank M. He was. The person that I truly punished the worst ever in, in that in, in that octagon cage 
First off, because I can, and and secondly, he needed it. He needed right. humbling in that. So I, I watched him when he he knocked out a four pound sumo with one punch, and as that man <laughs> laid there helpless and hapless, his body his body is contorted and involuntarily, you know, kind of what we refer to refer to for fight world, the little the funky chicken flop boys there, and and, and then Tank had the audacity to strike him again. I'm like. A, as soon as he, I saw them do that, I'm like, I actually, I, I leered up in my chair. I, I'm like, oh, you son of a bitch. If I should ever have you in that cage, I go, evil will be God, a greater evil. I could turn on things that you don't even have a comprehension about. And I mean, literally, I, I, I do it. I got my wish. Yeah, that's what happened. Because I know you both, you both defeated him. Um, you both beat him, but I think you, like you said, you had this almost retribution type of uh, oh, there, I mean, literally, somebody counted up. He says, He says, He goes, The answer, he says, You, he says, You reached to the sky, he said, You struck him with like 287 <laughs> right elbow strikes along with when you could go, What was those, the 12 to 6? And, and I go, I did not have kind intent for him. No, I mean, literally, if I could have crippled him in the process, if I could have killed him in the process, you might have. In, in, in my heart, in my heart. The world would be a better place without him. That's again, that's the way I truly feel because he was so evil. I mean, even Bray Gosiously would say you could take all the other UFC's rap sheets and add it up to to mine, and and, and they'll never, add, you know. And, and Big John McCarthy was the LAPD, and I I asked Big John, I go, oh, what, did you ever do any homework on take to find out what his background is? Yeah, he's, he's, he's had a lot of drunken, disorderly fight and stuff like this, but that's that's a horrible legacy. I mean, that, that's a legacy that will – somebody who has friends with Smith and Wesson will finally take you out. It doesn't matter how big and bad, bad you are. It's We don't live We don't live in that, that era where people, if they have a problem with each other, they step outside, they thump each other a couple of times, they come back in, they have a drink, and let bygones be with bygones. That, that era is long gone. Right, right. But there's one name that you both fought. And I know you both fought Ken Shamrock, but I think like when I saw you guys talk to him afterwards, it's completely gentlemanly. It's completely competitive, right? They would right down like it wasn't it wasn't any bad blood afterwards. I'm talking about during the fight, you, you obviously get competitive and all that, but afterwards, you guys were totally looking at it like like uh, you both went through some kind of a war and you both survived sort of this competitive type of thing, right? Yeah, I, I respect I respect Ken Sham, Shamrock deeply. You know, I think he's an amazing athlete, and uh, you know he's got problems like all the rest of us do. But you know, as an as an athlete, I think he's phenomenal. Yeah, he's done a lot. He's a former Marine, right? Too, John, I believe. Yes, well, sir. He was, yes. Yeah, he was he was in the Marines, and then he beat the hell out of his senior drill instructor, <laughs> which is not a good idea. And he's mm. just the guy that could do it. I mean, he'd be the scariest recruit going through Marine Corps boot camp. I mean, how, if you're a Marine Corps drill instructor, I mean, I mean, you've got to be. They're, they're fearless and they're and they're sadistic. You know, they probably yeah. love the hell out of him. You know, and uh, here here he is. They're having to kick him out. That must have really hurt. But boy, he really just he. But but he trains the Marines and the Army. I mean, he, his passion. I mean, I, I've seen a couple of interviews, and man, I tell you, he just lights up when he talks about being in and around the Marine Corps and the Marine Corps fighting system that he literally went in and helped to rewrite. And I, I know one of the founders of the Marine Corps fighting system, you know, Royce Coffey. And, uh, you know, that's a pretty amazing uh, accomplishment. And so he's really uh, res well-respected. So I, I think he gets a lot out of that, but his credibility, I mean, I've never met anybody who beat the hell out of a Marine Corps drill instructor. <laughs> Man, that's a that's an amazing story. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, they do it against Shamrock. I'll get oh, yeah. your ass. You know, he's a powerful, powerful, you know. And he grabbed hold of me and I was like, son of a bitch. You know, just yeah, I felt like a little schoolgirl. <laughs> and yeah. you guys went at it like it was an amazing war right to the last second, man, till the bell went. And yeah, yeah. it, it could have gone either way, man. But I tell you, it's, that was one of the best fights I've ever seen. Thank you. Thank you. I think you're wrong. I think I dominated him. And I, and I, <laughs> I should have been a, a, a superior decision. But, you know, <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you your, your, 
your opinion. <laughs> hey, I, I got, well, you were my I, favorite. I'll just tell you honestly, because I, I hadn't been following Ken that much, you know, <laughs> and so, uh, but I'm, I'm glad you won it. Let's put it that way. Me too. <laughs> I talked too much shit to have lost it. <laughs> hey, hey, guys, I was talking to another name that you both know, uh, Boss Rutten. He said something really that I, I couldn't understand. He said that to us, to fighters, when we're going to a fight, it's not, it doesn't, it, it doesn't feel the same way that it feels to you guys watching it on TV. To us, it's just no. an extension of training. And that's what he said. I said, "Wow!" Well, I because I, I've seen a lot of emotion. Like when you when you fight someone, there's a lot of real, sometimes real feelings and the real competitiveness. He said to him, "It was not like that." And because of that, he said, "You know, after the fight, it was not such a big adjustment to him." It sounds to me like it's really an individual thing, right? Because I think it's different for everybody. And when you depend, absolutely, on the yeah. I mean, boss, boss. I love boss. He's a great guy. Obviously, a better human being than I am, because uh, you know I had I had to create a hate for each opponent, you know, and that's what drove me and gave it to me, you know. But boss, boss is a unique individual, you know. Dan, Dan has never been in a fight in his life. It's all competition to him. It's, but I think but, it's but, but nice. though, but that was said earlier that. though. But don't cut mine with me at the buffet though. Okay, yeah, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I draw. Yeah, yeah. Don't ever cut, cut me off of that buffet line. Yeah, I'll say yes, stay put, you know, woman. Oh. <laughs> Yeah, then when you said that, then I don't know. When you say you've never been in a fight in your life, <laughs> it looked to me it looked like you've been in a lot of fights. But you know what? Do I, what the hell do I know? <laughs> But um, what, what are you guys? What are you guys working on? I know you're traveling the country, you're doing a lot of different. Today you had a show, right? But um, do you, do you? Uh, Dan, you do a lot of um, seminars still, like you well, yeah, do. No, yeah, no, I, I love. Well, again, I, I love teaching. I actually, uh, I, I, I was a coach at both at Arizona State and at Michigan State, so I enjoy the coaching aspect. Teaching my first love of, of amateur wrestling. It's something I've been doing since my seventh grade uh, time frame. I love teaching that, uh, but then also it, you know jumping into the wacky world of professional wrestling, you know. So I jumped into that because it was so it was such a uh, such a loose organization that um, you you could have a name for one move, but it, it might be conducted several different ways depending. On, are you from the south? Are you from the north? Are you from the east? From from the west? And I kept thinking that I, you know, I'm a person that I understand mechanics. So I simply, after I would ask several different people that I trusted in in the industry, how would you do this move uh, realistically? And then I just made it law that 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 was the way it has to be done. And I always would tend to fall back to one of the more older traditionalists, especially if, if they had a good uh, shooter background with it. So. Gotcha. And uh, yeah, again, I I love teaching that, but but I also like I like seeing them achieve success in the process. Yeah. So to, to help others, but then also, I had a son too that uh, you know he fell short. He uh, basically he looked at me like, uh, well, what does dad know? Okay, and it's like, well, I I I I want, I, I want my son did or my child to do the best that they possibly can. They they kind of failed. I had to let him poke around a little bit and then sit him down and. And you know, sit and talk to him to see, okay, what would you like to do differently? And then, you know, he did come back his next couple of years and he achieved a great deal of success, but he he had to put in all that work and that effort. And the hard part about anyone that wants to be successful and anything to do is there's a, it, there's an aspect of sacrifice. Right. You have to sacrifice time away from family, time away from friends. And because a lot of your friends, they talk a good game. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And when they don't, and they start seeing you do, then it's kind of like going, hey, uh, Sean Henry, let's go out. Let's get shit-faced this Friday night. You know, it's after the football game. And I'm like, well, no, I can't because I got to go. I, I got to make weight on Saturday. I have to go wrestle on Saturday. I can't be going out to doing it if I'm getting shit-faced on, on a Friday night. But, you know, they're like, oh, what's the matter? You're not a man? I mean, they start playing the man card on you. They start to, they, hit, they start hitting you with different things towards like you go, no, I have a plan. I have 
a goal. I mean, I mean, that's the yeah, hard part. Real responsibility, you know, taking that responsibility and committing yourself. Yeah, so. that, that's just, no, that's, but but that's that's the hard part when when you're when you're trying to set a, a goal for yourself. Other people are going to try to pull you back because if oh, you yeah. if you break out of the pack, you're that unique individual. Absolutely. Right. Isn't it all mental? I mean, this is what I think is such a big connection here between what John does and what you guys do also. This is a mental game. I think this is all mentality. Because then you just well, said you create, you, you make them winners in their mind, yes. right? Not yes. just physically. And, and, and you have to, I mean, when I, when I was first uh, assistant wrestling coach at, at Michigan State, they, they had such a poor program. I mean, they were in the basement of the Big Ten. And so basically, I, I did I did two things that they weren't doing already. I, I would have a couple of chairs in front of the TV set and, and then rewind the video to, to, to let them how, teach them how to analyze matches, to see the redundancy of what's, what some your opponents are doing something that, and how you have to do something different. And, and right next to me, I had the couch. I called it my shrink couch where you're there. I got the headset on to you and I, I got these positive motivational type of things going to you. So, so I, I'm, I'm like brainwashing one guy over here. I got this, this couch going on there. I'm running practices in the morning. And if you didn't show up, you would wake up because I'd be thumping you on the forehead in your dorm room. As you wake up and you see me, it's like, come with me. You and I work out now. So it's like, but it's like, you know, but they, they, they got a great deal of respect. The, the funniest one, I probably shouldn't even mention this one, but this is comical because I had, I had, I had, I, I'll, I'll leave, I'll leave the name nameless. He'll know who he is if you ever hear the story. He was, he, it was a two day tournament. Usually on a two day tournament, you have to make weight each day. And they'll, they'll, they'll graciously may, maybe give you one or two pounds. Well, my one wrestler did not think he was going to make it through the first day, so he really ate and drank a whole lot more. So now he's got the sweatsuit on. He's got the he's got the cottons on. He's got the the sweatsuit, vinyl suit underneath, and he's and and he's breaking. And coach, I can't I can't go anymore. Like, go get in the sauna. Just go to sit. Just go sit down, relax in the sauna. He gets in there, and then I, I, a few minutes later, I appear. I'm in the sauna there with him. Hey, he looks up. He goes, Coach, I can't get. And and but what he doesn't realize is. I've stripped down to my underwear. Okay. I'm in the sauna there with him. With him. There, there's other wrestlers stuff like this. He gets up and he goes, and he said, I can't. The fear God. <laughs> <laughs> my, my fruit of the loom. <laughs> <laughs> and he gets, he gets up and I push him down. His eyes got bigger saucers. He said, coach, I go, I said, and, and again, I'm like going, Don, you have to wait. I, mean, I, said, I, said, I, said, I said, I said, this is the, the biggest curse is, is that wrestler will always make weight. He said, you have to make weight. He gets up and he, he tries to get past me. I push him down again. I go, <laughs> I, he comes up, he comes, he comes up. And, and now I start pummeling with him. It's a, it's a, a wrestling routine. He starts pummeling. I go, come on, come on, there. get mad, get past me, push up. And I, he's like, you know, he just keeps working, working, working. I push him to the back this way, push back that way. And literally for like the next, whatever, 10, 15 minutes, and, and he gets to a point, he's he's crying, he's sobbing, he's in, he's laying, he's laying down. And I go, good, cry, get some more weight off your body, something like that. I said, you're gonna make weight. I said, I said, you know, because he was close as as it was, and I, and I just let him lay there for for just a little bit. That I I basically pat him on the back. Right off that extra pound. Yeah, and then, <laughs> and, then, and then and then as he laid there, or something I pat him on the back. I says, let's go. You you made weight. Wow. And he, he go you go good, but. He doesn't know that. I still don't know that. But he gets back out there. He gets he's, he's pulling all the cotton sweats off him. He's pulling the vinyl sweats on off him. I got the squeegee uh, towel. I'm wiping them all down there. And he steps on the scales, and that scale just barely drops to where he made weight. And wow. then, yeah, but 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 when that moment is done, I mean, he like he embraced me. And he, Thanks, coach. I could have never done it without you. That's the that, you that, that, that. your <laughs> <laughs> Hey, that's the I, truth, I right? think I think in that same 20, 30 minutes I've been in there with him, he lost his that that pound and a half for two pounds he had. I, 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 <laughs> I think I probably lost six pounds in there because I'm fat and I'm succulent and I'm, I'm, I'm felt well watered through. So it's kind of wow. like it, it's just yeah. one of those things that you do. I mean, because I mean, that well, was like, all like part said, of all the wrestling team stuff like that as well. Could not have done it without you. Listen, without that mental, uh, without that push, without that smack. 
Yeah. Oh, Again, it, 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 it's comical when you think about some of this stuff right now, but at the same token, you, when you were there and you're going through it, it it's it's a, it's a it's there's such a mental game in all aspects. That's what wrestling is. It's, it's such a great it's such a great sport because <laughs> the definition of wrestling is a team sport based on individual performances. I can't tag somebody else in. I'm not on that football field. I got ten other players that that could do the job. I love football more than I did wrestling. Yeah. But you had to rely on 10 other players to do their job the same as yourself. And when someone would miss a block, somebody misses a tackle and the team loses, then you know you did everything that your <clears throat> possibility, then that makes it a little bit tougher yet. That's so again, true. athletes, I mean, as I said, athletes was my, having seven, seven <clears throat> other brothers and sisters, wrestling was my avenue to pay for my education so that I could do better. I mean, I, my first, one of my first thoughts was I, I did have a couple of my fellow teammates. They had older siblings who basically upon high school graduation did go into the military for, for a couple of years. They come on out and then go to college on the GI Bill. So that was actually option number one. I'm going to go this road. For I got, excuse me. I see man about a horse. <laughs> but uh, yeah, when I had when I had my uh, opportunity yeah, when we were by my sophomore year, I have a couple college courses, uh, college coaches that are like, if you keep this up, there's there there is a potential to receive scholarship money. So option number two came to the equation. So that's one of the things that I do a great deal when I speak with young athletes. I try to help them to to learn how to create options in their life. It may not always be for scholarship money or stuff like that, but the other ways of there's more than one way to simply to go out and to achieve success. It doesn't always have to be through athletics. Exactly. Exactly. I'm sure John would agree with that statement, right? It's, yeah. it's all about the mentality. It's all about showing them options and showing yeah. them what else. Well, one one of the hard things though that that uh, and I'm sure John will probably agree is that it's hard for it's hard for young men to show their emotions. Because when they're around other men, that that's what the hardest thing is to get them to really to open on up. Because they think that they're supposed to eat nails and uh, you know never show any kind of weakness or emotions or things of that nature. And uh, you know that's kind of like the environment. Because you you know like I remember my father, you don't cry, you know you don't cry, you know like <laughs> but I am <laughs> you know, big old blubber, right <laughs> you know. So wow. but you know no, but listen, we're taught as men, we're taught all over the world, right? Um, yeah. And I know people in different continents, different, and it's one thing that unites us all is, is we're taught not to show emotions. We don't have emotions. If you have emotions, you're a pussy, you're a scumbag, yeah. and you, you shouldn't even be among us. And that's a problem. I mean, now it's, you know, because emotions are still there, and uh, we see the result. I, when I work with, with, with a, lot of, a lot of veterans, you know, I find myself saying a lot when they start really opening up and they start really kind of getting in touch with who they want to be and what's standing in their way. I mean, I'd say, I just tell them, you, you know, you can still reach out and choke somebody if you actually have to, but you may never really need to, you know, it's like, it's, you're, 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 you're living in a different world, you know, and, uh, and it's time to learn some new things. Like, you know, uh, I can tell you when I got in the Marine Corps, I, I had a very limited range of emotions that I would allow myself to have. And I had a very, very limited vocabulary. And I was really shut down and I had a rage problem. I got a lot of trouble in the Marine Corps because of fighting and just rage. I didn't like to be told what to do. And that's a problem if you're in the Marine Corps, you know? And so I deal with a lot of vets that, uh, you know, they're, they're just like that. They're just so stoic and numb, you know? Um, and I, 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 I'm glad you came back, Don, because I wanted yes. to say something I think is really, really important. I'm really glad you set the record straight about a confrontation with the police. Cause it's been written up that, you know, suicide by cop, right. absolutely not the case. Number one. Right. And number two is I can't tell you how many veterans that I know, man, they just have had it. And they, they, they there's just in a life situation yeah. where they, they, they just lose their shit. And it's got nothing to do with wanting to kill themselves. It's got, I'm just, I just don't want to be messed with right now. I don't That's, care. I don't fucking care. Right. You know, pull the trigger, you know, either way, 
Liver day, I don't give a rat's ass. You know, I've had enough. That's that's exactly it. And I think, you know, when you're talking to vets, differentiate because they they want to be heard. They want to they want other people to understand, like, hey, you know what? I, they're not interested in taking their life. You know, right. I think there, I think there are some. I can't say that. There there are some where that's that's the option for them. But you being able to differentiate what was going on for you is the rest of the story that I'm glad I heard. Yes, sir. Well, and you know, I, I, I gave a couple of interviews where I said, yeah, I tried suicide by cop. I didn't. But, you know, my ex-wife and a friend of mine had told me that's what I did. So that's why I, I, I just parroted it. You know, I repeated it. And it, it wasn't true. I said, wait a second. I just didn't give a fuck. I mean, I think it's it, it's that's the process you got to go through is you got to unpack some of that serious shit that you, how can you process that stuff in the moment? And you're right. I, I tell you, it really pissed me off. Uh, my son, he, he, when he was killed, he was doing 120 miles an hour down an unlit road at midnight. Wow. Um, and his therapist, I could just wring his fucking neck, told me and his other teammates that it was suicide by motorcycle. Yeah, right. You know, and just this, 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 to, to just generalize that and spread that around right. you know, really, really pissed me off because mm -hmm. I just talked to him hours before. He just got this amazing job offer. His life was going places. He was really well thought of. But that little story that the therapist started tried to propagate, I mean, I just shut him down pretty hard. Yeah. You know? But I... It's one of those things where, you know, you, you, you got to tell your own story, you know? Well, <laughs> well, the thing is, you know, I mean, I know I'm not trying to take over your story or, you know, or it, it, it intercept it or anything, but maybe your son just need that one more little inch of adrenaline, you know, a little smidge of adrenaline to get him over the top. You know, that's what he was doing with his motorcycle. So, you know, you become an adrenaline junkie. You know, through war or through fighting, or what have you, you know, or parachuting, uh, motorcycle riding. It, it's it become, it become a junkie, a habit, you know. And maybe that's all he needed is that one more touch, you know. And that, and that's, you know, it just it went south like, like a lot of times it does. I don't know. What do you think? I think that's exactly it. It just, he, he was a, he, he just, he would, he actually was the most alive in combat. Right. And so, and his men loved him and he was really cool under fire. Right. And he just knew how to operate. And so he needed to get some of that. And it was probably just that little extra, I mean, 120 miles an hour down an unlit road at midnight. Give me a break. You right. know, that is. That's exciting. It's yeah, it's it's it's, <laughs> it's it's the maximum adrenaline that you know I can imagine. So yeah, it's probably what it what it is, Don. It just he just pushed it too far, and they think maybe he tried to avoid hitting a deer or something. Yeah, I was gonna say maybe a squirrel cross the road, or you know, you you never fucking know, you know. So know. you hit a rock at right, that at right. that speed, uh, at that speed, a little fucking rock could tip your motorcycle over. Yeah. Yeah, you know, but a well, deer or a squirrel or something like that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I tell you what, uh, people, soldiers, soldiers love life. They appreciate life, you know, and they will do anything to protect life. You know, even even kill to protect life. And I think that's what was happening. Is I think a deer, you know, or, or a squirrel or something, got and he tried to protect that fucking life. Yeah, no, no. he died a hero. He died a hero when his goddamn social worker tried making him, you know, give him a stupid story, you know, make him look like he's weak. He was a weak. He was strong, and he was heroic. Well, you know, the end of that the, the story, the next chapter is there was a there was a a, a, a a therapist inside the VA that was mentoring him to take, I think ultimately to take her place when he graduated. And after his death, she filed to have his motorcycle accident, his death service connected full yeah. honors. And yeah. after like three or four appeals, she, his, his death was deemed service connected, even though he was out of the military, 
because 120 miles an hour was an adrenaline seeking need to cope with his symptoms of PTSD Absolutely. and the weed and the alcohol in his system were self-medications trying to deal yeah. and cope with his PTSD, which was well documented. You know, he had a pretty high service connected disability rating. And so his wife got, you know, the death benefits and he, and his, you know, his, in his honor, well, yeah. I think, you know, he had a purple she heart and stuff it. like that, but that yeah. was really, to me, like, wow, that's, a, that's a set of new precedents, I think, you know, for, for service connected deaths in this right. case. Right. Well, they both did. Your son and his wife deserved it, man. They should have got it. It's so the least, least we could do as a society, right, Don? I mean, yeah. should they deserve that and way more. That's, Agreed. That's not Agreed. I tell you what, every fucking serviceman that comes back should, you know, or their family, if you know, from a dead or disabled or what have you, they should never have to pay taxes again. Yeah. You know, none of them. They fucking served. They did combat. You know, why Why should they pay taxes when you got these fat, lazy bastards, you know, with signs, you know, saying, you know, no war, we, you know, we want abortion, we want this, we, you know, you give us this, give us that. They got their hand out, they don't do a damn thing, you know, and they don't pay taxes. So why should our servicemen and women do it when they, when they go out there and they fucking fight? Yeah. To no. keep us safe, right? To keep all of us safe, man. And that, right. totally agree. Totally agree. This is the best country in the world, on the planet, you know. And we should, we should fucking reward the people who are willing to go, you know, to war and face death for us to protect us. The, the, the bottom line of all that is, freedom is not free. There's a cost for freedom, and the cost is giving your life in the name of freedom. So. I mean, and there's no there's no payback for it. it well, I, I totally agree. Yeah, there's there's a lot of wrong things in the United States. It's still the best country to live into, but uh, we're continuing to lower the bar. And I don't like that. I want that bar to be raised, if anything. So. Hey, Dan, that's why it's the greatest country in the world. It's the bar, yeah. even if it goes down a little bit, is going to go back up. That's how it is. That's what makes it great, right? Hey guys, we take, I, I feel so bad. We took a lot of your time. I really, really appreciate it, man. No, well, you know, actually, I think we, we enjoyed this this conversation. Just again, the you know, bike I beat us. I know it's our, our second time of, of interacting with you, but you know, to be uh, John Henry to be to meet you and uh, to hear your story. What what an honor and privilege. Like I said, you know, we're we're just a couple old old fart uh uh you know athletes right there, but yeah. uh you know. We have a great deal of respect for the military and for what they do. Yeah, neither one, neither one of us, man. So, you know, go to war. So, God bless Say you again? all. Yeah. I said, neither one of us were man enough to sign our name, you know, and join the military. So, thank you. You know, God bless yeah. you. Man, it's all amazing. Right. It's amazing to spend time with you guys. And I got to tell you one quick story. I, I, I deal with a lot of young people right in business and then uh in in the military <clears throat> and when i meet meet mostly young men who are fanatics about the ufc and i mention your names they're not they haven't been here long enough to know who you are but it's funny i have a couple of videos that i have on cue uh, one with you don with uh takayama and the instant they see that they're like holy shit i remember that right like their dad used to watch this all the time and then <laughs> and then dan you with uh macias doing that suplex that it just about yes. took him oh, out I, I always tell, I always tell people that was my very first match ever i pulled that off and it, it, it was it was comical because when i when i was at the registration table they had females that were filling out the forms because they didn't think any of us neanderthals could actually spell right or right in the first <laughs> place and so when they're asking you your your height your weight and where you hail from and i was asked the question first question ever that was what's your fighting style i had never been asked a question like that what's your fighting style i pause for a moment i go i'm an american wrestler well, th this they had never heard that answer before. So she like she looks left and right, and then leans in, <laughs> and she goes, 
what exactly does that do? So I kind of mimic her. I go, I pause, I look left and right, I lean down in, I go, you might want to watch. I'm kind of making this up as I go. And she starts <laughs> she starts laughing like she's like can the camera. I go, I go, but I am I I only trained for five days, an hour and a half a day, and here I am, you know, <laughs> flying by this. I, I didn't tell a single family member. I wow. just told them, I told the, the family that I was like, I'm gonna go off and wrestle this weekend. I'll be back on Monday. And literally, based upon my skills, that's all I was gonna do. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> story. Amazing. Hey, before we jump off, guys, um, let me ask you both: Are you do you, are you more uh, do you like to read uh, books or do you like to listen to audio books more so? I read books. Yeah, I like to read books, but I, okay. I will listen to audio. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I was gonna say because I'd like to send you both a signed copy of my book. I would yeah. really, really be honored if you would read read it. And if you're more of an audio book guy, then I'll send you uh, a free gift to listen to it on Audible. Um, yeah. But it would mean a lot. And maybe we could have a conversation at some time, you know, after you go through it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely, sir. I love to love that. Love All right, to. guys. Thank you guys so much, everybody. Send, I really send me both. That way, that way I don't have our shoes. That, you know, that way I have your autograph. Okay. Absolutely. Of course. Yes. Fellas, All appreciate right. it. We'll talk soon again. What, John, I mean, okay. before we take on after John Henry, I mean, at some point down, we would love to have you on the, the Toxic Masculinity podcast or, as well. Wow. You know, talk, so that way you can talk about your, your book and things of nature. Because again, this is, you know, we're, like I said, Don Fry and I were, you know, we're, a lot of people thought that, that we we're going to be just talking about fights. You know, or talk about professional wrestling, but we're, we're we're also a bit of a variety show on a lot of different topics because we want to know what what makes people successful in business world, what makes people, you know, tick and others. We, you know, we we have people that uh, I well again, one of the things I was hoping for by this summer by this coming summer was I was hoping to interview my high school wrestling coach because what an impact he had on my life. Well, he just passed away a couple weeks ago. So it's like going, mm. you know, it just wanna say that happened. And and now, you know, I, I I will never have that interview. But one of the one of the cool things about it, if you can say a funeral was cool, was when they were having all the different speak and stuff like that, I I felt so compelled I have to get up there and say something. So literally I walked over to the side and as the preacher is starting to finish on up, I might go on, you know. I just literally started walking up to the uh, up to the front there, and I go. I said, I, I mean no disrespect. I go. I need to say some words, but then, but I opened up like the floodgates because there were another half a dozen men behind me. Mm. They had to come on up there as well to say their piece because he was such an inspirational man, and how uh, he helped to inspire them to do something cool in, in their life. So it was like, you know, when it was all said and done, you know, even the family members, they were so thankful. Even though we weren't part of the, uh, we were part of the uh, program whatsoever, but it was right. kind of like, I just, I, I was, I was moved that I have to go up here. I have to say something on behalf of this man. Well, you know, my request would be uh, take your time reading the book or listening to the audio book. I find that the best interviews that I just really appreciate are when people have read the book and they understand a lot more. It's so much more meaningful for us to have a conversation instead of yeah. what's your name, where you're from, what do you do, John Henry? I mean, that's for me. <laughs> Interview. it's 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 not as personal but uh, i gotta tell you when i i was talking to my wife about i was going to be on this uh interview with you guys and i told her about toxic masculinity and she did she doesn't know who you guys are and she, her, her sentiment was like just don't embarrass me <laughs> oh, guys, Funny, I'm getting, look at the title how can i can embarrass you how can you get embarrassed right? like yeah well, how are you going to put your foot in your mouth you know with that kind of title you're just going to be all you know full full gain right yeah yeah kids are going to be a campfire men thumping their chest you know yeah. <laughs> and uh, someone no, rocks you 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 can thank this old cowboy back here for the name toxic masculinity he's the one that came up with that I, I, okay. stole it. I stole it from the liberals <laughs> No, Dan, but I think I think John would make a terrific uh, storyteller there, and I think more people. My job, as you can imagine, is to make sure a lot of people, as many people as possible, hear this 
uh, he's a historian and read about his work because it helps so many people man it's it's unbelievable and the same thing will be when you when you guys talk again on toxic masculinity will be my job to spread that as much as i can because even if you help one person overcome that that difficulty you already did the job but you're going to help thousands and thousands so i think that's that's a no-brainer absolutely yeah Thank you. Thank yeah, you for, for bringing us all together, partner. Of course. Listen, yeah. that's what it is. I appreciate it, guys. I'll connect uh, John with you uh, with you guys, and we'll figure out what else we can do. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Fellas, thank you so much, all of you. Appreciate thank you, guys. It, brother. Have a good evening. Right. Thank you. Take care. Thanks, John. Thanks.